Paul, back at Hanover Messe, when you were chatting with Peter Corte around the industrial metaverse, you made the comment, we all need to be better explorers. What do you mean by that? Well, I, actually, I think we all need to become better explorers, both individually and collectively, su such that exploration becomes one of the key organisational capabilities of this and the next phase of the digital economy. So what we've seen over the last years, I would argue, is a transition from command and control types of approaches and strategies that have embraced those decentralised network types of approaches characterised by collaboration, cultivation and cooperation. But actually, I don't think that's anywhere near far enough. We need to kind of zoom and accelerate past those approaches to ones that actually invite exploration and engagement. And, and the reason for this, Kevin, is, is that fundamentally what I see actually happening around us is a bridge being built. And it's a bridge that's being built between the programmability of the world of bits and bytes and the world of atoms and molecules, the physical, biological, kind of carbon-based world that we've kind of grown up with. And the funny thing about bridges, of course, is that they invite you to cross them. But what are you going to do when you get to the other side? <laughs> okay? And this is where the exploration and the engagement comes into this. We all need to become better explorers so that as we cross this bridge, as we look at the opportunities, try to harness the potentialities of this, this new world that we're actually entering into, well, actually, we can make sense of it. We can set out new paths, chart new courses, meet new people, meet new places, and create, capture, and deliver new value as we're doing so. Now, to, to build on that point, you know, again, in, in your chat with Peter, and we've been chatting previously, you mentioned that that exploration, the, 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 the art of the possible, the, the possibilities, it's all about a collaboration of humans and machines in partnership. It's not that they're replacing us or whatever. So again, how, how, do, you, how do you flesh that out? Well, I actually, I, I see it more as evolution than revolution, actually. And yes, we, we talk about a human and machine partnership, but as we sit here today, um, sitting in front of our computers, our kind of tablets, our smartphones, etc., I'd, I'd like simply just to recognize that the algorithms, the code, the data that's sitting on those machines is fundamentally reshaping, re-sculpting, the partnership that we have, recalibrating the partnership that we have with humans and machines. And in which ways? Well, I think it's recalibrating the roles, the relationships, the responsibilities, and the fundamental reality of human and machine partnerships. So almost, we might look at this as, um, as a double helix. You know, if we were to go back to Watson and Crick and the um, the structure of the DNA molecule that they put forward, that twisted, remember the, tw the twisted kind of double helix kind of ladder? Well, if we think for a moment of the two uprights of that ladder representing the physical world and the digital world that we all live, work, operate within, well, those uprights are actually held together by a series of human-centric genes, proteins, algorithms, whatever we want to call them. So things like curiosity, creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, compassion, and perhaps above all, consilience, the idea of unity and unification. That's actually holding the partnership and the relationship together. And, and there's one critical extra point about this as well, Kevin, which is that fundamentally, I like the idea of the double helix kind of metaphor, because it implies that the evolution and the growth is going to be in unison. The human and the machine partnership over the next phases of the digital economy is one that we're going to see growing together. Um, yes, maybe at different speeds and in different directions, but fundamentally linked together by those human-centric capabilities. And so I, I think one of the things that we need to bear in mind is the responsibility that we have to ourselves, to our colleagues, and to our organisation to have and give the permission to explore the opportunities and the potentialities of this double helix. We live in a time of wonder. Let's make it wonderful, yeah? That's a great point. 
Now, speaking of the, this, this wonder and, you know, you crossing the bridges, exploring more, uh, the next phases, where does game theory and gaming principles play into all this? Oh, well, I think actually in a number, in a number of interesting and impactful types of ways. So, you know, if we just take uh, one or two steps back, you know, or almost pretend we're like those pointillist artists, uh, you know, currently we often kind of have our nose to the grindstone at work or kind of our nose right up against the mosaic of, of, of kind of our work responsibilities. Take a couple of steps back for a second and, and, and allow the colours and the contours of the actual pictures we have in front of us to come into, into, into better focus. And, and I think we'll recognise the value of games and, and game theory more readily. So from my perspective, uh, games, the, the best games that that is, always offer um, an opportunity to explore a microcosm of some aspect of our lives or of our, our organisations or our work. They, they give us the opportunity to explore, again, and, and, and to practice strategies, tactics in a safe way. But, but, but not only that, what, one of the beautiful things about games, whether it be um, board games like, like, like chess or, or, or Go, whether it be um, sports like uh, soccer or tennis or golf or what have you, or whether it be video games, um, World of Warcraft and, 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 and everything else, not only do they allow us to, to practice our, our own skills and, and approaches, they give us a very tangible sense of our limitations and invite, inspire us to improve. And, and not only that, they, they also give us a very strong sense of what it feels like to lose, yeah? to, to have a, a sense and appreciation and respect for our opponents. Um, for every great move we might, we might make with the white pieces in a game of chess, we have a person or people or machine on the other side moving the black pieces. Yeah? And so it gives us a sense of how to calibrate our approaches given the context and the realities in which we find ourselves. And, and, and something that really strikes me um, in today's context about the value of games is sustainability. Yeah? The, the idea that when I, when I play chess, um, I have 16 pieces. I only have eight pawns. I better use my resources very carefully. Yeah? I have to try to extract as much possible as much possible value from the pieces I have in front of me as, as, as I can. Yeah? It becomes a game of efficiency, of resourcefulness, but also using my resources to the best of my ability. And I think that's a very important lesson for all of our organisations to bear in mind. So in, in, in summary, I, I would say that games offer us a number of opportunities to improve the way that we, we work, we interact, we collaborate in our, in our organisations and the way that we see the improvement of our strategies so that we can create competitive advantage, competitive differentiation and create that robust, sustainable, productive future for our organisations. Um, your comment there on the sustainability and how it ingrains us to think about the best use of resources, that, that's, that's fascinating. And now, for folks that know me, I play a bit too much Fortnite, and I, I certainly get the, I, I understand my limitations when I lose quite a lot. <laughs> um, but, it, but it is fascinating how, how you can use, if you, what people see as a pastime or a something else, how, you could, how we can use that to our advantage as we head down this, this path of the, the next wave of digitalization. I think it's fascinating. If we, if we kind of hone in for a second on this periodic table, um, if you will, of uh, disruptive and transformative technologies that we have in front of us. Yep, we, we have a, a period and we have a family of AI technologies. We have lots of elements of XR, extended reality and metaverse, of, of, of course, as well as crypto economics, um, analytics, data families as, as, as well. But what I think is particularly interesting is the opportunity and the potentiality we have in front of us today to create almost compound innovation where we're bringing together a number of different elements from different areas with almost a single family of goals, which is to drive the immersion, the engagement, create that inspiration and, if I may, even the aspiration to kind of move forward, to kind of move towards new places. And as, as I look at kind of the, the opportunities we have in front of us, I see it very much not as a final frontier in any way, 
but, but almost a forever frontier. Every time we take one or two te- steps forward in the industrial metaverse or with generative AI or any of these wondrous technologies, what we're actually seeing is the horizon move further away from us. And this, I think, is something we should embrace and be very, very excited about. It's almost a siren call to our innovation, to our opportunity, and this kind of harnessing of the human spirit to explore and move into new areas. This provides a lot of opportunities. Yes, there will be challenges along the way. We need to be realistic. We need to prepare our workforce. We need to invest in our workforce. We need to support our our, our existing and emerging clients. But we also have to embrace the opportunities and create the organizational capabilities that are going to carry us safely to that robust and sustainable future. You mentioned earlier we we live in an age of wonder, you know, and and if we think the pace of change and the pace of innovation, and I like the compound innovation, if we think things are are, are moving at at a pace right now, you know, Time to buckle up. We're, we're just getting started on this. And, and even that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, today, as, as we sit here um, in, in our various kind of countries, our various locations, our, our various kind of home offices, we're spinning at, what, 17 or 18,000 kilometers an hour, yeah, through, through as, as the Earth kind of rotates and, 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 and moves. So, so kind of speed and acceleration and velocity from a physics perspective are kind of a complete norm. What what, what I would argue, though, is is that we need to create almost a structure that allows us to kind of take advantage of the velocity so that we're moving in the right directions. You you know, on on, on one hand, we have, as as you mentioned, this kind of incredibly wondrous um, toolkit of technologies, uh, the like of which humanity has never kind of had in its grasp. And then on the other hand, we have a series of very significant challenges, whether they be organisational or around how we're going to create the next generations of our, of, of our organizations, or whether they be societal in terms of climate questions, war, poverty, transport, increasingly water shortage, etc. So how, how, how should we think and act about this? So I, I think bringing the two hands together so they actually clasp and, and kind of hold each other firmly will allow us to, to travel through that velocity and that accelerated speed of change in a safer, more comfortable way way. Yeah? If we can actually create structures that allow us to feel more comfortable with this uh, accelerated speed of change, well then I think we're in good stead and in a good position to actually take advantage of the opportunities we're going to have in front of us. Paul, this has been fascinating. Come here, thank you so much for your time and I hope to see you in, in the real world soon, somewhere. <laughs> so this isn't the real world, crikey. <laughs> <laughs> It, 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 it is fascinating times we live in. And, um, but no, Camille, thank you so much. This, this has been fascinating. Thank you. Thank, 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 thank you, Kevin.